He took his battle to the heartland this week. NDP leader Tom Mulcair made his first and very closely watched visit to the oil sands in Alberta. Would Mulcair continue to call them the tar sands? Would he compare their development to Nigeria, as he did in the House of Commons? Would he still argue that Canada is suffering from the so-called Dutch disease, where development of the oil sands, he argues, raises the value of the Canadian dollar and ends up killing manufacturing jobs across the country? Well, after his visit, here's what Tom Mulcair had to say. Our thesis has always been one of the reasons we have an artificially high number of U.S. dollars coming in is because we haven't internalized the environmental costs. We haven't included those costs in the product. So allowing a bit of a free ride in terms of using the air, the soil and the water uh, in an unlimited way and in an almost free way has artificially brought, uh, brought up the number of U.S. dollars and that's having an effect on the currency. That effect on the currency in turn is hurting all export sectors. Now, Mulcair's visit and his comments are very crucial because he had kicked off a national debate when he appeared back on this program on May 5th and spoke about this. Let's remind you what he said then. It's by definition the Dutch disease. The Canadian dollar is being held artificially high, which is fine if you're going to Walt Disney World. Not so good if you want to sell your manufactured product because the American client, most of the time, can no longer afford to buy it. We've hollowed out the manufacturing sector. At the present time, the way we're exploiting and developing the oil sands is causing an imbalance in our economy. That's demonstrable. All right, those comments set off a fury of reaction from federal conservatives to provincial premiers that called the comments variously goofy or offensive. But perhaps the most outspoken person has been the Saskatchewan Premier Brad Wall. He has called Mulcair's comments divisive. Has Mulcair's visit to the oil sense changed anything? Does he raise valid points about the way Canada is developing its natural resources? Let's find out. Joining me on the line is Saskatchewan Premier Brad Wall. Premier Well, welcome to the House. Good morning, Evan. Well, let's talk about that visit. Tom Mulcair, the NDP leader, finally uh, visits Alberta's oil sands. Uh, you had called his comments about how it's being developed as divisive. What did you make of his visit? Well, I appreciate the fact that he came. He said he would, and he did. Uh, maybe there's a potash mine tour in store. We'd welcome that uh, because he's not just talking about oil sands. He himself has said... He wants uh, this internalizing of environmental costs, whatever that means for the natural resource industry, which would have a, potentially a big impact on our economy. But uh, still, he came. His tone changed, and I welcome that. But, you know, if you look very carefully, and to his credit, he's still pretty blunt about having not changed his position that we have Dutch disease, which, uh, and that the West is costing manufacturing jobs, and that we need to internalize the quote unquote internalize environmental costs in the resource sector. That's cap and trade or a carbon tax, and it's part of a debate. But we know that could cost jobs in the West. So and here's the other point. I mean, he mentioned that he wasn't going to use the word tar sands anymore, that he would use the word oil sands, which is also helpful if it's sort of meant, if it's sincere. And I take him at his word, but uh, he uses I, I think I, 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 we're, back to, we're back to having the right kind of a, at least a debate where the tone, I think, is right and... Uh, that's important, but substantively, we have real concerns still. All right. Uh, let me pick up on a couple things you said. The first thing you talked about is this Dutch disease, uh, his contention that somehow the development of the oil sands has taken jobs away from manufacturing base. Well, on Friday, GM just announced that they're going to close their big plant in Oshawa, costing Ontario 2,000 jobs. Uh, some might wonder, Premier, isn't that the illustration of what Tom Melker is talking about, a boom in the West, manufacturing jobs closing in the East. Only if the two, you can directly link them, uh, and then it would be difficult to explain away the fact that there has been, uh, in the last report by Stats Canada, an increase, an historic increase in manufacturing jobs in the country. Uh, and so I, I just think it's overly simplistic to say uh, that A has happened and so now therefore B is happening. In the case of the automobile sector, I don't have the stats. But I know that there has been uh, some robustness in that sector in Canada, uh, in U.S., in the U.S., yes, but also in our country. So I, I think that's the problem because if we're, if we're too quick to link things that may not be linked, it's not an informed debate, especially when the facts say manufacturing has actually increased, according to StatsCan. His point now, he says, is polluters pay. You've got to enforce federal regulations. He says through a cap-and-trade system, he, he believes to price carbon, although he argues that, you know, Alberta's got a 15% price, a $15 price per ton on carbon already, and it hasn't hurt that province, uh, so does uh, British Columbia. He's arguing make polluter pay. What's wrong with that? 
Well, you know what? Uh, it depends what he's talking about because these are two different models. If it's the uh, uh, homegrown Alberta model, something we're pursuing as well, when, and we will price carbon similarly. And what happens then are the, the emitters actually pay into a tech fund that they can access to invest in the technology, like clean coal, for example, where we're trying to provide some leadership and reduce emissions. Cap and trade is something different. Cap and trade really is, in our, from our perspective, it's moving emissions around. It's a tax, and it's a transfer potentially out of a region of the economy where jobs are being created. So I think there's some agreement that we can have this kind of a program. We have the legislation in place for, for a fee for a levy ourselves, but it needs to stay in the province, and it needs to fund the technology that will actually deal with the problem and not simply shift the emissions but around. But that, that's a huge... In, a huge point here. If British Columbia's got a price on carbon, if Alberta's got a price on carbon, if Saskatchewan's about to have a price on carbon, and you can choose to do what you want with it, whether to take the fees and put it into a technology fund, as you say. Why do you think the feds are so opposed to any price on carbon if they keep saying any price on carbon will hurt the economy when now the, the economies that are growing are saying it won't? Well, I mean, to be fair, I haven't heard that. And I mean, I stand to be corrected, but I ha- haven't heard that from the federal government. They have, they're actually emissions. Uh, GHG emissions on coal fire plants and their, uh, their their greenhouse gas legislation is informing what we have to do as a province. But I think we've been pretty clear with them that, look, if we, we want a, a an equivalency agreement, so we are hitting the targets that are set by the country, we should. We're a part, happy to be part of the country in this regard. But we need to be able to keep the proceeds in the province. And uh, that's the difference between the two uh, methods. And what Mr. Malcaro is proposing is would, by definition, transfer, first of all, tax the industry. And at what level, we don't know. Uh, and, and the taxing maybe is not the bad part if the proceeds go to, the, to the, what we've just talked about. But then to transfer it. And, uh, you know, there we part company in a dramatic way. And I think what the West will as well. And, I mean, we can have this debate, but now hopefully we've moved to the point where it, it is a, a robust debate and uh, each side will make its case and one side won't be a messenger for any other interest in the Canada, in Canada, et cetera. Well, you said that, you, you used that code word messenger because Tom Mulcair said uh, that some of the premiers were messengers for, for Stephen Harper. He also compared the model to Nigeria. He's clearly changed some tone. Did Has he done enough? You called it divisive. Has he done enough to repair what you consider the damage that he did or not? Well... Uh, you know, on one hand, their grace is amazing. It's, you know, so we've all made mistakes. I've certainly made them, and you uh, you admit them and hope to move on. On the other hand, that's a lot of toothpaste to get back in the tube uh, in terms of the debate with the, not just uh, premiers but others in the, in the, in the country. However, again, I, I think the former is the best approach to say, look, we've, uh, we've all misspoke if that's what it is. Now, now, form follows function, so we'll see what you know, what actual co- what comes from the NDP on policy. That's the important piece here. All the other debate, who called who what, really is immaterial. It's what are the policies being proposed? What do they do to the Canadian economy? And uh, that's what remains to be seen yet, Evan. You had um, part of the innovation, uh, you and Robert Giz, the Premier of PEI, right. were talking about that. Uh, and I know there's, an annou- there's not a lot of details, but health care reform is absolutely critical. The president of the Canadian Medical Association, Dr. John Hagee, said the federal government has, quote, abandoned health, and it's been the premiers who have been left with the task of providing a national framework. Do you agree with that assessment? Is there, what's the role left for the feds? Well, the feds have said, look, here's where the transfer's at, and uh, the health is a provincial jurisdiction by and large, even though they have a, a department. So, you know, we can't wait any longer. We can't wait to improve the system. Uh, and premiers were serious in Victoria when we said we would, and we talked after that meeting, Evan. Uh, they've asked Premier Giz and I to cheer the health ministers in the country to get real results, real recommendations on actionable items to improve care, to bend the cost curve. We've engaged the providers in it. You're going to see as a starting point. Remember, these will just be sort of the starting point after only seven months of work. We're going to have specific recommendations in terms of different models that are working across the country that where, where professionals are, are using their full scope of practice. You're going to see uh, a recommendation for uh, clinical practice guidelines so that uh, we can provide better care on key chronic diseases across the country and be more efficient about it. And finally, on the HR function, you're going to see us involved. One of the innovations, outside of innovation, just new ways to control costs. And one of the big cost drivers is the is, is fees doctors collect. Uh, now, in Ontario, Dalton McGinty's examining ways to reduce doctors' wages, and he sent out a letter to other premiers across, and health provincial health ministers across the country to essentially control doctors' wages. Uh, would you support that? Will, will your province and your health minister sign on to that? 
Uh, first of all, let me just say, we understand, I understand completely where Premier McGinty wants to go. In fact, if, we, if you talk to providers, they understand that we have to modernize fee structures and compensation for current uh, practices, for technology in the system. Some procedures take a lot less time now, but the fees haven't changed to reflect that. So we understand that that's exactly what the McGinty government, Premier McGinty's government is trying to do. But we're all at different cycles in our work with doctors, and we need the doctors and the nurses to be a part of this innovation moving forward. They've been a great, they've helped mightily in the process that Premier Giz and I have chaired with the provincial ministries. And so we need to ensure they're involved but I think each province is going to take some action on this front um, in conjunction with their providers. We're probably a year out away in our own case in Saskatchewan, and some of the very things that Premier McGinty has raised are concerns to us. We'll introduce them in the context of those talks. But you're not going to sign that letter. You're not signing on that formally. Uh, no, no, because we're just not there in the cycle yet. And I, for us, that just doesn't make sense. I mean, one of the advantages of all these different healthcare systems is that we can pilot best practices. Uh, the other the other fact with the, all these various healthcare systems is that, uh, uh, you know, we, we need to take different approaches. We'll all be in different points and point, uh, points in the cycle uh, of our negotiations with our providers. And you know, that's just the reality of the situation. Premier Wall, thanks so much. Good to talk to you today. All the best. 